Thank you everyone for joining today. Hope everyone's day is going well. Um, today we will be talking about ICS20, cross-chain token transfers, fungible token transfers. Um, we've been going through the stack of IBC, went through clients, connections, and channels. And now we're actually kind of venturing outside the core part of IBC and we're venturing into the application side. And so today's talk will be heavily focused on understanding ICS20, and I'll talk a little bit just about IBC applications in general. Um, I plan to start this with kind of a walkthrough of some of the different components of ICS20 at kind of like a higher level. Then we'll probably dive into the code and look at like the interface between core IBC and um, IBC applications. And then I'll point out some of the code uh, for ICS20 um, some functions I'll just skip over because I think it's things that people can read in their own time and others I'll go through. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to stop me because I'm sure other people will be thinking the same thing. And uh, hopefully today's um, presentation will be informative. Um, I had all the information in my head yesterday, so we'll see if it's still six today. So I find that ICS-20 is something that can like come and go and you need refreshers for. So if we look at this diagram that's been revisited throughout these deep dives, we are finally at the top level here where we have this application, ICS20. And there's some different logics here of like, you can send a transfer which escrows your tokens. And you know maybe if that packet send fails, then maybe those tokens are refunded. Otherwise, maybe on the receiver chain, those vouchers are minted upon success. Um, so the basic idea here is that we're going to be creating a packet at the application level, and then we're going to be passing it to ICS4, the channel level. And the channel level is going to do some stuff, and then a relayer will act in between and do the actual sending of proofs around, which then can be processed on the receiver chain. And likewise, uh, for acknowledgments and timeouts on the sender chain. But let's go ahead and uh, go into the code or go, go into the diagrams that I have. Um, so this is kind of like a basic setup I drew for today that we're gonna kind of be visiting here. A, B, and C are all chains. And then each of these lines represents a channel. Um, one second. Cool. So uh, just to make things easy, I made it so on chain A, they're all, all the channel numbers are like one through nine or zero through nine. And then chain B is 10 through 99. And then C is a hundred and up. Um, so this is just the basic idea what we're gonna be working with where you can transfer between A and B and you can actually have, um, an important thing to note is that you can have two channels between the two chains, but they're actually different. Um, and one thing we'll learn is that denominations of IBC tokens include the port and the channel ID. So if I were to transfer from A v channel, via channel two to B, that won't be the same token as if I cha transfer through channel five um, to chain B as well. So it's important to note we can have multiple channels to different chains. So what's less important is the chain's name and what's more important is the channel ID. Um, and these different channels might provide different security guarantees. And so that's why they can't be considered equivalent, but we'll look into that more detail and I can answer any specific questions as they come up. Cool. Very so we're- question, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Very short question here, because I was thinking about that before. What happens if A sends a token to B, changes the denomination, and then the channel falls, is, can, is uh, closes, let's say. Does mm -hmm. the denomination cannot be transformed in the original native of A? Correct. So if you transfer a token across a channel and the channel closes, that token can no longer be transferred back and it's stuck on the other side. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So we'll first just talking about the easiest case here, which is sending tokens in the forward direction. And I like to use like forward and reverse direction when talking about these transfers. And you can think about the forward direction as like going to a new chain. And you can think about the reverse direction as going backwards. So in the case we just talked about, you send 
from A to B, that's the forward direction. But if you want to bring it back for the actual native denomination, that's the reverse direction. Um, so let's start with the forward direction. So let's say we want to send 100 atoms from chain A to chain B. Well, in the happy case, what we're going to do here is on chain A, we want to escrow tokens. And this is kind of easy to reason about. If we want to transfer from one chain to another, just thinking about this protocol in general without actually like implementing it, you'll think, OK, I probably need to like escrow some sort of tokens or mark that I'm uh, sending them to the other chain and make them unavailable. And then the assumption is the other chain is going to create some sort of representation for those tokens that are also transferred. So in this case, we go ahead and we escrow our native tokens. Then we construct a packet. And the relayer will relay that packet. And if it's successful, if it's a successful receive of the packet, then chain B will mint vouchers for those atoms. In the bad case, in the sad case, we escrow the atoms on our chain A. And for some reason, after we send the packet, it never gets received. Uh, maybe something went wrong on the receiving side for processing it or maybe the packet timed out um, because of no relayer picked up the, the packet. And so in that case, in a timeout or in a failed acknowledgement, then we go ahead and we unescrow those tokens. And one can think of this transfer as less of transferring from chain A to chain B and more of transferring from transfer channel two to transfer channel 40 on this other chain, which has some associated connection and client as well. But we can abstract that away just by thinking of transfer channel two on chain A and then transfer channel 40 on chain B. So now what happens in the reverse direction? So we went ahead and we transferred our atoms from A to B. And now, so our atom, we have 100 atoms on chain B and we want to transfer them back. So now what's going to occur is we're going to transfer 100 of what's called a transfer channel 40 atoms. We're going to transfer them backwards. So chain B will go ahead and burn those vouchers that it minted. Because if we go back in the happy case in this first step, chain B had minted vouchers for the atoms it received. So if we're transferring them back, we go ahead and we want to burn them. Then a packet will be sent from chain B. The relayer will go ahead and relay between those two chains. And chain A will unescrow those atoms that it had escrowed. Um, in the opposite case, in the case where we run into a timeout or a failed acknowledgment, then the first step is still the same. We burn the vouchers, we send the packet. But when it fails, what we do is we go ahead and we mint those vouchers back because we had burned the vouchers. There's nothing to unescrow here. So this is sending in the reverse direction. And when uh, in the happy case, when we're unescrowing the atoms, right, we're not unescrowing transfer channel 40 atoms. We're unescrowing atoms because that's what we had escrowed on the original chain. So you'll notice there that the prefix of the denomination is removed. So when we sent in the forward direction, we added a prefix. And when we sent in the reverse direction, we removed a prefix. And that's why I like this like forward and reverse. Forward is adding more to the denomination name, but the reverse direction is taking away. And it's important to note that in order to send in the reverse direction, it's not enough to send them on a channel that goes back to chain E you need to send them on the exact same channel that you had sent them across. So if I send from channel two to B, and then I send it across channel 80, that is not considered a reverse direction. That is a forward direction. And part of the reason with that is we don't actually know at this application level that what these channels correspond to. Channel 80, for all we know, could correspond to chain C. So we can't make the assumption that they are equal. And therefore, if we're transferring across a new channel, which we did not receive the tokens on, that's a forward direction. Sure. Oh. Sorry, Colin, uh, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, as a follow up of the question that Marius had. So if the channel drops uh, and this, the, the tokens are stuck in chain B, 
then the only way to recover would be to, 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 to set up again a channel with the same channel ID on both sides? No, it's impossible because you okay. cannot create, channels are unique. You cannot recreate a channel. Okay. There is no recovery method for it. So, so there's no way because... Uh, but, so I think we're getting lost in the details here. If a, if a ICS 20 channel closes, that literally means that either the code was like incorrect and like failed, or the chain has been taken over by a 66% malicious validator set. Because the way ICS 20 is written is channels cannot be closed. Okay, yeah. Cool. So I wouldn't worry too much about channels closing. The, the thing that is of important consideration, which we have seen is if clients expire, um, and what we have not seen of like a client being frozen, but there are recovery methods for that. Um, and I th but I think those are out of scope for this conversation because those are recovery methods for any sort of IBC application. They are not specific to ICS-20. Cool. So going back, something you'll see often when talking about ICS-20 is like this notion of a source chain. I think the spec references this in some of the code as well of like this source in sync um, terminology, which you'll see across uh, in different areas of computer science. But the idea here is with the source chain, in our case, it actually depends a little bit on the context. Um, and the source here, I like to think of like where the, like where did the tokens originate from? Um, who actually like, created these tokens originally. Um, and uh, it kind of boils down to talking about this forward and reverse direction. But more concretely, um, I would like to understand this in a way where we can understand it. And then that informs us whether it's the forward or reverse direction. So the first question I think is like the easiest one to knock out, which is like, are the tokens, tokens native to this chain? If those tokens are native, then we must be the source because we are the original creator of them. So there is no, there's no reverse direction, right? We're the first link. Um, so that's the easy question. And if they're not, then comes this other question, which is, are the IBC tokens being sent on a channel they were received on? So in this case, we're saying, were these tokens transferred from chain A um, to chain B are they now being transferred back in the, the, uh, the reverse direction? And if they are being transferred back in the reverse direction, then this chain is not the source. That's actually the other chain, right? Because we're transferring backwards. But if they are not being sent on the, chain, on the channel they were received on, then we're sending them to some other channel. And so we're going in the forward direction here. And so there we have the chain as a source. So more concretely, when we send atoms from A to B, chain A is our source. When we send the IBC atoms from B to A on the same channel, chain A is still the source, right? Because we're going in the reverse direction. But if when we send these IBC atoms, we're sending from B to C, now chain B is the source. So here we can see in the second and third example, we're talking about the same tokens here. But when we reference them in a different context, the source chain changes. When we're talking about sending them in the reverse direction, the source chain is the one that will receive. And when we're talking about sending them in the forward direction, it's the sending chain that is the source. Cool. Um, and you can think about this as like, you're causing another chain to mint tokens. Uh, whoever's escrowing is really the source. Um, so if when you're receiving tokens, if you're going to be unescrowing them, that means you're in a reverse direction transfer. So you're the source. You have the tokens on your chain available. You don't need to mint them. Um, this I find very complicated in ways to reason about. We'll see a little bit how we determine this in the code, um, but it'll take some time to sink in, I think. Um, ooh. So now I just want to talk about like the basic logic because I've been saying escrow, mint, and burn. And um, it depends on you know whether we're in the forward or reverse. 
And whether we're in the forward reverse informs which chain is the source and which is the same. So in the case we're doing this forward direction transfer here, then we are go as the source, we're going to escrow our atoms, send the packet, get them relayed. And then the sync chain is going to go ahead and mint the, mint the new IBC vouchers for those atoms. But now if we're going in the reverse direction, where we're sending from the sync, we're going to go ahead and burn those vouchers. And we're going to unescrow the atoms on the source chain. So here we have the forward direction. And here we have the reverse direction. And that is all of the logic that is uh, mainly encapsulated in ICS-20 is either escrow and minting or, uh, or burning and then unescrowing. Um, I have one question. Are you going to go um, in details like how the scroll works like in, on the chain? What's the concept? Like, does it go to an account? How, how does that work? You don't um, need to I, mm -hmm. I will briefly go over that, but that is mostly, um, I will be going into the code. So okay. I'll be yeah, pointing the line where it's as growing and minting. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Cool. Um, so now we're just going to go quickly go through some examples just to make this as super clear before we go into the code. Um, so first we have our source to sync transfer. And in this case, we're going to append the destination port and channel ID. So this is very important. We append the destination port and channel, not the source. And this is very important because this gives us a nice property of we know, as discussed, that channel IDs within a single chain are unique. So a channel zero on a certain chain, it's not going to have two channel zeros. It only has one channel zero. And so by always appending the destination chain, this allows us to uniquely track all of these denominations as we transfer them. And then as we transfer them back, we can know which chain, which uh, we can know which channel these tokens had arrived on. And so when I transfer from A to B, when I append this transfer, transfer in channel 40, now I know for future reference that this token on my chain, which has this appended transfer channel 40, I know this first prefix, that's the channel it arrived on. And that, that's very important and we'll come back to that. Cool. And now, so if we go to the uh, sync to source. As I mentioned before, we're going to head and we're going to go ahead and remove that denomination. So I have this um, transfer channel forty atoms on chain B. Chain B looks at this denomination, and uh, when someone says they want to transfer these across transfer channel forty, looks at this denomination, sees that the first prefix matches the channel that it wants to send it across. So it goes ahead and sends it back. And when chain, e, chain A receives it, it's going to go ahead and remove that denomination because it knows that it is receiving back tokens that it had on escrowed. And when it escrowed those tokens, it didn't have the denomination prefixed. Because in the packet, in this first transfer here, we represent the denomination as just atoms. Once it's actually received on chain B internally, it is notated as transfer channel 40 atoms. And when it's sent back, it is referenced as transfer channel 40 atoms, not atoms. Because then chain A would get confused on whether it's talking about atoms on its chain or the atoms on chain B. But when it receives the transfer channel 40 atoms, it knows that these are coming from a different chain as an IBC token. And another thing that uh, I going into ICS20, I was trying to refresh myself yesterday. And thinking about this source and sync can get really confusing, but I realized there's a very important property here, which is that all channels are one-to-one -one mappings. And so when we start to think about the source and sync, trying to determine it from the context of our chain, when we know these all channels are one-to-one -one mappings, then it gets rid of any weird cases, like what if the channels have like the same name? So like channel zero on chain A and channel zero on chain B. Um, but the important part is that channel zero on chain A is connected to a specific channel on either chain B or C or whatever chain it's on, but it's not connected to two channels. Um, so that's it ends up being a very nice property that we'll hopefully look at and realize 
later. So now kind of walking through these transfers in a little bit more detail before we go into the code. So we want to send 100 atoms from transfer channel 2 on chain A to transfer channel 40 on chain B. So the sender side logic is going to first ask, who is the source chain? And in this case, we're sending atoms. And these are native denomination. So we know we are the source chain. So since chain A is the source, we go ahead and we escrow those tokens. If I go back up here, we see the source escrows when it's sending. The receiver side logic also asks this question when it receives the packet of who is the source. And it sees that this uh, denomination in this packet is just atoms. So it knows that the chain A is the source chain because it's transferring a native denomination. Since chain A is the source, it appends the transferred channel 40 to the denomination, and then it mints those in representation of those atoms that were escrowed on the sender side. So on chain B, we have just received this IBC token. And we go ahead and we write a successful ACK if we are able to actually receive those. Otherwise, perhaps we write a failed acknowledgement. On the sender side, in the case of a failed acknowledgement or a timeout, it asks again, who is the source? As the, the same logic as above, chain A is the source. So in that case, we're going to go ahead and unescrow the tokens. We're going to undo the step we did to send. So now in detail of the reverse case, we begin on the sender side. So now the sender is chain B, and we're transferring our IBC tokens back. We say, who is the source? So the first thing we do is we check the denomination path prefix. And we're just going to check this first prefix of the destination port and the destination channel. And we see that transfer channel 40 matches the source port and the source channel we're sending across. And so this must mean that it's in the reverse direction. If it were different, then we would be sending across a new channel. Um, and you can imagine if there is a different channel right here, then if they didn't match, you'd be sending across this different channel to perhaps some other chain, perhaps also to chain A, but it might have a different client. It might have a different uh, security guarantees at the connection level. And so you would be doing a forward transfer in that case. But because it matches, because these are IBC tokens, and we have this property of always appending the destination port and channel, when we remove that prefix, we're basically checking locally on our own namespace. We're not checking the namespace of A. We're not checking the namespace of C. We're checking the namespace on our chain. And so if the appended prefix matches the channel we're transferring, across, we're transferring across, then it must have been received on that channel. And so we can send it back and we can know that the prefix will be removed. And when we're sending it back, we're going to go ahead and burn those tokens because we had minted tokens for them because they did not originate on our chain. The source chain is A, so we're burning them. On the receiver side, we do the same source check. We check to see if transfer channel 40 the first prefix in the denomination that is referenced in our packet, we check to see if it matches the counterparty port and channel, or in other words, the source port and channel in the packet. And as we went through in core IBC, the packet information cannot be messed with and uh, the core IBC, if implemented correctly, will ensure that the source port and channel is actually being sent from that port and channel, and that the destination port and channel, that the packet is actually being received on that port and channel. So now at the application level, we can actually take advantage of that information and not have to worry about some trickery of like what happens if a packet gets sent on the wrong port and channel. That means it would be routed to a different important channel because we have a one-to-one -one mapping here. So on the receiver logic, we do that check. We see chain A is the source. And we go ahead and we remove that prefix. And we unescrow the atoms. Because after we remove the prefix, we see it's just atoms left. 
and we get the amount and we unescrow, and then we write our successful acknowledgement. If for some reason we can't unescrow them or something else goes wrong, then we write a failed acknowledgement. In the case of a failed acknowledgement or a timeout, again, we do the same logic of checking the source, and then we do the, the undo step of the sending side. So in this case, because we are going from sync to source, we had burned token, the tokens. So the undo step of burning is minting. Ooh. So now let's say we're sending these IBC tokens, but we're actually sending on a new channel now. So as, the, as always, we check who is the source. We check to see that the prefix of the denomination here, transfer channel 40, it actually doesn't match the, the channel that we're transferring across. We're transferring across transfer channel 80. So those two do not match, which means that the channel we're using to transfer these tokens is not the same channel that those tokens were received on. So that means we're doing another forward direction tr transfer. We are the source chain in this case because we're causing A to mint new tokens in representation of transfer channel 40 atoms. And so the source to sync, as always, we will go ahead and escrow the tokens. The receiver side will do the same check. It'll realize that chain B is the source. Since chain B is the source, it'll go ahead and append the destination port and channel. So in this case, transfer channel five and then it'll write the successful hack. And then again, in the failed hack or timeout case, we check the source and then we do the undo step. In this case, the undo step of escrow is an escrow. And so it's quite confusing from a high level to think we sent from A to B and then B to A, but now we have 100 transfer channel five, transfer channel 40 atoms and not just atoms. So it's very important to understand that when you transfer across a new channel, those underlying clients and connections could have you know, completely different security parameters. And the same client could actually be eh, like the same chain. If these were two different clients on the two different channels we're representing, let's say they had a different trusting period. It's possible one of those clients could become expired. It's possible one of those clients could become frozen and the other one not. And so, in these cases, they cannot be redeemed equivalently because tokens sent across one of those channels could still be fine to be returned, and the tokens sent across the other channel would not be fine to be returned. From like the perspective of like end users or exchanges or whatever, that's like a massive problem, I guess, right? Like, I mean, was there ever like talks for some sort of service to track expired? like tokens or tokens that can't be redeemed on like the original source chain. I'm just like imagining like, you know, you could, you could pass tokens like through exchanges and it's sort of like this, like I guess derivative with like a huge denom and people are like using it in like some sort of liquidity pool, but it actually can never be redeemed for like the original atom amount. Mm -hmm. um, I. I'm sure there was definitely some discussions on that, but there are still recovery options available if direly needed. Um, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess. Okay. Yeah. So there's always a, a recovery option, basically. At some, yes. At some but level. The recovery options cost, right? Like the recovery options we have now are either like a governance proposal or an entire chain upgrade. Um, and so both of those cost a lot of uh, time and money. And so perhaps the tokens that are like stuck on one side are actually not worth those recovery mechanisms. So there certainly could be some sort of service, but again, those tokens are stuck for a reason. Those tokens are stuck because we can no longer actually trust the like client algorithm anymore to be correct. Yeah, and if that was the case, probably a lot more has gone wrong anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's also important that there's no inherent reason we need um, two channels between chain A and chain B for ICS-20, unless perhaps we have different versions of ICS-20, but then presumably they're doing at least some sort of different functionality. Um, cool, and then I just quickly wanted to talk about this other case, which is like 
the port here doesn't always have to be transfer. It could be this custom transfer name. Um, so in that case, everything still works exactly the same. It's just in the denomination, you're going to have this custom transfer. Um, I, I have one question. Um, I think maybe I asked it actually in a previous uh, discussion, but I just forgot. Say if you have two transfer channels, is there any advantage to like an increase in throughput if you had like multiple channels or? No, be well, at least not in IBC Go, right? Because the, the throughput here is dependent upon the tenements processing of messages, which are all sequential. Okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, I also have a very short question. Why do we need the port? Because if I remember correctly, the channel, it's a one-to-one -one mapping between channels and ports. You cannot have multiple ports for channels. Um, is that correct? That is correct. I think you could get rid of the, the, um, the port. Okay. Uh, at the, yeah, I'm not sure. There was at like, uh, at one point, the, the channel identifier was being selected by the relayer. Um, so maybe the thought way back when was that you wanted the port so that you could um, know that the tokens are being sent across ICS-20. Um, I mean, it might just be useful for discoverability also for like map of zones and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, but I think because the channels are unique, they're always inherently associated with um, this port. So I think it would be fine to remove them, but uh, they, they, they were kind of, I think we're uh, past being able to remove them. I think it's fine to leave. It, it, it isn't your, um, like a, a, as a router from the application perspective that depending on the port, it will- So the packet will always have the, the port and channel. And it does need it for that information. But when we're transferring this information between chains using the ICS-20 protocol, it would seem fine to me just to reference the channel IDs. But I may be incorrect about this. Um, cool. Uh, so oh, the last slide I want to talk about here is kind of, uh, I've already talked about this a little bit. But the important part here is determining who is the source just by looking at the denomination, the, the prefix, the first prefix in the denomination, and then the, the channel we're transferring from. So let's say we're on chain B and we want to send 100 of these transfer channel 40 atoms. So if we go ahead and send them on the same channel, on transfer channel 40, this channel is actually connected to chain A. So that would actually be a reverse direction. So when the packet source, when this packet source and port are equal, this is a reverse direction transfer. And then when they're unequal, so let's say we transfer them across transfer channel 80, then this is going to be a four direction channel where we append. Um, and I think this slide might be useful later to reference, but we'll see in the code where this happens um, in just a second. Cool. Any questions about all of this information I've thrown at you? I hope these slides have been useful. Yeah, this is great, man.